Hello and welcome again to Speech Communication 4345 Crisis Communication. This evening our primary topic is substance abuse and in the second half of class we will have a guest speaker with us who works at one of the neighborhood centers in Pasadena and I'll be introducing her to you a little later on. She's also a former graduate of this class and we're proud of that. Uh, in the first part though we'll, we will be talking about substance abuse and uh, uh, if we have time, I'll be previewing a little bit at the end about what we'll be doing next week uh, when we have another guest speaker here and we'll be looking at medical communication, some of the health communication issues as we close out the semester. First of all, how old do you think drug abuse is? Any idea when people first started abusing drugs? In let, days. Okay, in the Roman days, says there. Let me remind you to hold down your microphone button, Robert. Uh, the ancient Sumerians used to um, brew a type of beer, mm -hmm. and the people were so addicted to it that um, there was like uh, the the priests at the time period would provide. They would pay so much money for the beer because they were so addicted that they said that almost ninety five percent of the population at the time period was addicted to this and it was it didn't have like hops in it but it was um, it was like an ale type of, I guess we'd call it like an ale and um, and this was like I don't know my bruise well, I don't know, it, I, it was it's, some, it's not like a the one it's not like a present um, brewing system that we do it today mm -hmm. but this was like over this was like three let's see from 2000 BC to about 3000 BC, something like that. Way back there. Way back. Way there. back there. Okay. Good. Well, I, I ran across, well, if you've been reading your textbook, that's where I ran across it. Uh, the, what, did, what did the Romans do for those people that are channel surfing out there and just catching up on this? How did the Romans uh, deal with the people that they thought were drunkards? <laughs> well, you can read the first entry on the chart up there. Okay, according to one source, they placed spiders in the bottom of the wine cups. Now, I'm not sure how much good it did, but I don't know. That would deter me at least a little, I think, if I were having too much wine. Okay, if we look on down this very, very brief historical sketch here, uh, colonial America turned out to be a, a pretty happy place when uh, people discovered that an acre of corn... Uh, yielded a lot more economically if converted to brew uh, than it did uh, simply boiling corn on the cob for supper. So uh, there, was a, there was a whole economic revolution that took place in that era and according to various sources people soon rationalized that uh, you know you just might need a little hot toddy for this or a little nip of something else to fix your hangnails or your stump toe or uh, consumption or, wh or whatever kind of ailment uh, you had. Uh, a little nip of something might help it along there. And then I just put 1785 wo uh, Westward Ho drunkards. Uh, by then uh, the, the West was wild, the, the moonshine was flowing and uh, you know, what, what would the West have been without the saloons? You know, it's, it's the prototype for a Western city to uh, gather around the uh, bar and, and all the shootouts at the saloons and so forth. About 1835 is when the temperance movement kicked in. And uh, it took them nearly 100 years or so. But eventually in 1920, the 18th Amendment was passed. Uh, prohibiting the sale of alcohol in this country and what happened then? Was that a good decision? Okay, it went underground. Robert? It made the desire for alcohol even more. Okay, probably so. Uh, certainly strong-willed Americans were determined they were going to get it no matter what and so organized crime uh, really had a boon at that point and so on. So it, enough so that just 13 years later the 21st Amendment was passed and that amendment repealed prohibition. Okay, so there you have it, several years of history 
<laughs> the history of alcohol in a uh, sketch. Um, Let's see, what do we want to do next here? Let's look at the extent of the problem. Uh, some 1991 statistics, and some of you may have turned in more recent uh, statistics in your papers this semester, but uh, the most recent I had on file came from 1991 Department of Commerce, which estimated that 10% of the United States population is alcoholic, or is alcoholics, 10% are, al are alcoholics. And that means that some 15 million people in this country are addicted primarily uh, to alcohol, uh, but we'll see that there's some other addictions that are substantial as well. And the estimate, it, the figures are hard to get, you know, and where you draw the line on who is and is not uh, an alcoholic, we'll see, is part of the problem. Uh, but that we have approximately 15 million who are alcoholics and another 10 million that are on the cusp, that are right on the borderline. And that's a fairly substantial portion of the population. Uh, I have a questionnaire that I didn't, it's, it's too busy to try to get on the screen. But I thought you can just kind of sit there and you know, mentally count to yourself. Uh, see whether you would answer yes or no to these questions. Uh, this particular questionnaire is used by John Hopkins University Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, and it's uh, been adapted a little bit by a local group called CompCare uh, so that it can be used in conjunction with uh, other drug dependencies as well. But uh, particularly with, with reference to alcohol, but you know, if anything else should apply, Okay, and you folks at home can get a piece of paper out and check yourself off. Hopefully your answers are no, but be honest because nobody's checking this test. Okay, do you lose time from work due to drinking or using? And if there are people in your life that you suspect of being chemically dependent, uh, you might want to uh, do an assessment for them too. So number one, do you lose time from work due to drinking or using? Secondly, is drinking or using making your home life unhappy? And that's one of those points of, of crossing over a line. If, if you have wine with dinner and that's a lovely sociable thing, you know, that's one thing. If, if there's a family fight occurring every time somebody uh, takes a bottle out, that's a different matter. Okay, number three, do you drink or use because you're shy with other people? There are 20 of these questions and all. Do you drink or use because you're shy with other people? And this will help get you less inhibited. Uh, is drinking or using affecting your reputation? Have you ever felt remorse after drinking or using? Have you gotten into financial difficulties as a result of drinking or using? Do you turn to, and you'll have to use your evaluation of this term, do you turn to lower companions and an inferior environment when you're drinking or using? Does your drinking or using make you careless of your family's welfare or the special people in your life? Has your ambition decreased since drinking or using? Do you crave a drink or a drug at a definite time each day? Do you want a drink or a drug, alcoholic of course, alcoholic drink or drug in the morning? Does drinking and using cause you to have difficulty in sleeping? Has your efficiency decreased since drinking and using or using? Is drinking or using jeopardizing your job or business? Do you drink or use to escape from worries or troubles? Do you drink, use alone? Have you ever had a complete loss of memory as a result of drinking or using? Has your physician ever treated you for drinking or using? Do you drink or use to build up your self-confidence? And finally, have you ever been to a hospital or institution because of your drinking or using? Okay, look those over. See if you've got any yeses out there. If so, count them up and keep them to yourself for now. If you answered yes, 
unless you want to come up here and have a confession time, but that's okay too. Uh, if you answered yes to any of these questions, this should be taken as a warning sign that you could be alcoholically or chemically dependent. If you answered yes to any two, the chances are that you are alcoholic or chemically dependent. If you've answered yes to three or more, according to this survey, you definitely are an alcoholic or chemically dependent person. Any comment or reaction? No, we got a real quiet audience tonight. Okay. Okay, well there are a lot of people out there who would flunk this test, according to the United States Department of Commerce. Okay, the per capita consumption for all intoxicating beverages for the past 10 plus 10 or 12 years has hovered, and I should have asked you, I should have covered that up, at 38 gallons per person. And I'm not contributing to that factor. I'm, I'm a two pina colada a year woman. <laughs> you know, so there it is on the airways, folks. Uh, but that, that means, you know, there's some people out there having 50, 80 gallons, I don't know. They're consuming a lot of alcoholic beverages. Okay. According to the Department of Commerce, roughly one-third of the population drinks 95% of the output. So we've really got a skew. Uh, shifting chemical dependencies here. There are roughly, uh, to our best knowledge, approximately half a million known heroin addicts, approximately two million cocaine dependents, but 85%, the best estimate is, 85% of all drug addiction is to alcohol. And that's why the focus of the examples this evening, uh, at least in this first part, is on alcohol. Uh, we'll find out from our guest later what, what she deals with at her center most. Okay, just a few more figures here. About 28 million children of alcoholics are out there, and I know some of you have expressed concern about uh, the number of children, and, and a recent estimate is about 28 million. This means that roughly one out of six families are affected, and codependents are estimated at 96%. What do you think the implications of this is? What does this mean? Melanie? No, be brave. Well, from the, what you just said, it means that almost our whole society is affected somehow by alcoholics in a very intimate and personal way. To be codependent, I mean, you can be, to code, you can be codependent in more than one way, but to be affected by alcoholics in that way is the, almost the whole country. Yeah, and, and one estimate in your book, in your text, says that some counselors believe that there are more codependents than there are people. If you've had small group class with me or a unit on that, you've heard me say that there are more small groups than there are people because we all belong to many, many groups. And if you are codependent with several people, then it's possible to have over 100 percent. Well, it's not over 100 percent codependency, but you end up with more codependent instances than there are people in the population. Maybe there's a handful of people out there somewhere who are not uh, codependent. And we'll be talking about codependency a little bit later on. I'll give you some questions and uh, uh, checks to think about with that. Okay, let's look briefly at the cost of drug abuse uh, because we pay dearly for it. Uh, not only do the users pay extensively for it, so the first cost is financial. Uh, you know, they, the users pay uh, 
substantial prices. And uh, then in terms of law enforcement, there's a considerable cost as well uh, for agencies and, and services that are related to uh, dealing with this. Uh, okay, one estimate said that the illicit drug trade is ranked in this country at about $80 billion a year. Uh, the source was four or five years old, but uh, at that time, uh, illicit drug trade was, was ranked right behind Exxon. And in New York City, at $45 billion a year. And the Narcotics Division in New York City estimated that uh, the illicit drug trade there employed over 10,000 full-time people and between 100 and, 2000, and 200,000 part-time folks, and that's just in New York City. So financially, uh, you know, there's, there's the purchase of, the, well, you tell me. I've got to get you all awake out there. What, besides purchasing drugs, how else does it cost financially? Go for it, Darren. When, when people in their workplace use drugs, it's the whole per, you know productivity of the company is lost, and it's just money down the drain because people aren't doing their jobs. Right, and that's probably the second major cost is the time lost from work and the poor work done at work. Melanie, well, when people use drugs, a lot of them end up not working at all, and we end up paying taxes to support them with either a disability if they get sick or with uh, unemployment or, um, you know. Okay, welfare, welfare programs right. of different sorts. Okay, Jason. Isn't a lot of our taxpayers' money spent towards fighting the drug problem? Mm -hmm. yep. Lara. Also, health care um, in reforming them and the other diseases related with alcoholism and, um, and that also has to do with work because a lot of the work fronts the health insurance bills and things like that. Yeah, considerable medical cost. Robert. And also the, um, the prison system. I mean, how many people are in prison because of uh -huh, uh, they're, yeah. they, they're on drugs or something and then they go and rob a bank or something or they kill somebody because they're on drugs. Oh, good. Then so, that links right into uh, number four down there. <laughs> <laughs> links to crime. Yeah. 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 Oh. And, and the crimes may be violence. They may be assaults, felonies, murders. Uh, Lots of property theft that's linked to alcohol, although uh, some people have maintained that, that that's not so. The sources in your text suggest uh, that there is a substantial link to property crimes as well. Okay, what's the psychological cost? Why, why would we say there's a psychological cost? Edna. Well, the person that normally are there drinking alcohol or, you know, substantially every day become physically and mentally beaten down by their behavior and stuff. So there's no self-motivation or, or even self-caring for themselves. Okay. And they affect the people around them too. Good. Lara? Also, children of alcoholics can become, I mean, they can be neglected and have become alcoholics themselves, um, be psychologically affected by their parents drinking, seeing that, being neglected, then deciding on their own inadvertently learning how to do that. Okay, good. Anybody else want to add on? Okay, just lots of mental anguish here from several directions. Okay, the physical cost, not money this time. We're talking about your, the body. Is alcohol good for your body? Now, some people I'll know maintain, you know, a beer or two here and there's a good thing, and that may be true. Uh, you but can gain a lot of weight. You can um, okay, weight gain. liver problems from alcoholism. Uh, okay. From drugs, yeah. you can get anything because it lowers your immune system. Okay. Then there's also Ed like the physical beatings that they might, you know, have caused to their own children or themselves. You know, not <clears throat> stumbling into walls or falling down if they, you know, are in a stupor. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to negotiate the stairs, uh, drive the car, and we're coming to accidents here. Okay. So there, there are financial costs, psychological costs, physical costs, links to crime that we've already uh, referred to, and then uh, tie-ins or implications in a number of accidents. 
Again, these are general estimates uh, coming out of your textbook about page 343 if you're double checking this for any reason. But roughly half of the highway deaths that occur both in Canada and the United States, uh, alcohol is involved in that. And uh, we didn't talk about blood alcohol level, but BAC or blood alcohol level uh, at point at 0.40 percent is where most people pass out and the LD level 50 is the estimate there that that's the level at which about half of the people die. Okay, uh, But anyway, about half of the highway deaths uh, in some 41 percent of the drowning, and this is going to vary from year to year of course, but about 41 percent of drownings, 58 percent of fires, a lot of people are, are drinking and smoking and set the mattress on fire, this kind of thing. Uh, you have vagrants uh, burning down uh, uh, substandard housing and so forth. Uh, stabbings, 68 percent. Shootings, 40 percent. Uh, all of these are types of accidents in which uh, alcoholism and chemical abuse have been believed to, drug abuse, have been believed to be significant contributing factors uh, in this. Okay. We kind of have a paradox because most people would say, I think, that occasional users, occasional drinkers, are not drug users. And yet, chronic drinkers are. So that may be something you want to think about. We may want to come back to it uh, and so forth. But, but each of us has to decide where the line is. Uh, you know, I don't know. If, if you go and have a beer, do you, can, or do you own the fact that you are drug using when you do that? If you take a Tylenol PM to help you go to sleep, you know, do you own that this is drug use? Uh, Melanie. I think more recently people are starting to understand that alcohol is actually a, a very abusive drug. And I think the more educated someone is, the more they realize that too. I think that has a lot to do with it because I've asked people um, who either used to drink and do drugs or still do. And mm -hmm. a lot of them, when they drink, they'll say, well, I quit doing drugs. All I do now is drink. And that's strange but yeah, it's some improvement I guess yeah but the problem hasn't gone away but I think a lot of it has to do with just knowing people just assume that if they're not doing hard drugs they're not doing anything wrong when they can go out every night to bars and get blitzed and drive themselves home as long as they make it they're okay but I yeah I mean is, you know is that is that the rule as long as you make it home then you're not drug abusing I don't know. You know, hold that thought, then, and, and let's see. And, and ultimately, it's a decision that each of you uh, has to make for yourself. I just, yeah. I don't think uh, alcoholism or alcohol uh, consumption is looked on in this society as being something that's really bad. I think that it's it's something that's seen as a social activity. I mean, if you watch any football game or baseball game mm -hmm. or anything like that, it's shown as something that's. Uh, not, <clears throat> maybe not even, it might even be necessary. It's almost seen as something that has to go along with something you're doing in life. Um, I mean, sometimes I look at an alcohol commercial and it's almost shown as if, it's like, a, like you're drinking Coke or something. It's not, there's no differentiation between the fact that it's something that can, if you drink too much of it, it can, it can harm you. Okay, the line seems to be on whether or not you can control it. And for different people, that line is in a different place. Well, let's look at uh, your book calls the models of addiction. Well, they're, they're approaches for explaining uh, what's going on. Let me see if I can get this a little better focus here. You know, because for a while it was maintained that alcoholism is a disease. And there's, there are people who feel that way and believe that. And I'm not sure, personally, not being a trained counselor in this, exactly where the lines are. Your text takes the position 
that there's an element of truth in each of these models, but that no one is singularly uh, the explanation for what's going on. Uh, but the, the disease explanation would say that exposure to the drug leads to physiological addiction. And for some people, that seems to be true, that they just they have a few drinks and, and very early on and very easily uh, they're addicted, they're hooked on the drug, and so forth. Uh, other people drink a few beers, go for months, you know, they seem to phase in and out of it. Edna? Comment on that. I have never drank anything in my life because I'm, I have that fear that if I drink one or two, I'm going to keep drinking. So mm -hmm. I just don't even touch it because I'm scared. Okay, and that ties a little bit to the next one, which says genetic predisposition. And, and that approach says what? Have you read this far, Robert? Uh, people who usually are alcoholics and have children. Sometimes there's a high correlation between the parents being alcoholics and the children also being alcoholics in the future. Okay, right. The idea here is that you can inherit this predisposition, that you can transmit it to your children. And so, uh, and, and that we know that there is correlation between abuse in families, that there tends to be uh, alcoholism within families. But whether or not that's an inherited predisposition, I don't know. You know, and, and for some people it may be and, and perhaps not for all others. But that's at least another approach uh, that's a reasonable explanation for this. Okay, you remember reading about the gateway model? Okay, it's kind of like the domino theory. It says that, that one thing leads to another and that, you know, you may start out with a few beers today, but down the line that's going to lead to harder stuff, which will lead to uh, uh, harder drugs. You know, you may go from beer to whiskey to marijuana uh, to pills to cocaine to heroin. I guess that's the order they go in. Uh, you know, but the, the point being that... Uh, a few social drinks now may very well lead you down the pathway, lead you through the gate to uh, heavy, heavy drug abuse somewhere in the future. And I suspect those, we'll, we can ask our guest later, uh, but you know, those who, who work with chemically dependent people, uh, do they see a lot of this or not? You know, do some folks just start by shooting up on the hard stuff and bypass other phases. Okay, the prescriptive model. This one says that, that basically people get addicted, uh, become chemically dependent because of either self-prescription or uh, like as in prescription drugs, uh, either through self-prescription or physician prescription of alcohol and or other drugs that serve as tranquilizing agents. Uh, sometimes this is to relieve acute or chronic pain symptoms. Maybe you've been in a car wreck, you have uh, chronic back pain, and so you get, you know, some heavy-duty painkillers to go with that and, and get, uh, get addicted to those. So anyway, the prescriptive model that the prescriptions, and some people just buy a lot of over-the-counter stuff and give it to themselves and self-medicate and... Uh, I know one person who, who easily doubles whatever the bottles call for on the assumption that the FDA wouldn't have approved it, you know, without a real wide buffer zone in there or something. So I'm not advocating that, folks. I'm just saying this is one of those self-prescription uh, things where somebody's decided that what they read is, is not really what the bottle meant at all. Okay, the psychoanalytic model number five says, what would you expect it to say? Good old Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis. Not sure, okay. Well, this would say that there are certain pathological personality traits that are established early in childhood and that these predispose the individual to alcoholism. 
you know, that something in your, in your youth and childhood uh, took place, that, and it may be repressed. Freud would probably subscribe to repression. But that there in your unconscious, uh, there may have been some kind of event, either a, a wonderful experience or uh, something peculiar that occurred. But anyway, something that in, in childhood affected personality traits and contributed to this. Okay, I probably have the most doubts about that one. Okay, the behavioral learning model would say what? Rob? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's the one where uh, usually the ch child p uh, patterns after the, the adult. Is that kind of like if the adult is an alcoholic, the child observes the adult drinking and then p patterns itself after the adult's behavior? Okay, that's part of it. Or maybe even peers, if, uh, if there are peers that are drinking alcohol, then, oh, that'd be part of that. Yeah, would that's be peer cluster model. That's that'd the be peer cluster. cluster. You but know, uh, everybody else is at the yeah. dome guzzling beer. So. Probably mostly like um, you have a parent or guardian, and then they observe the parent and guardian drink. Okay. Maybe that, and it may also just be that there's a positive, rewarding experience. Makes you feel good. Everybody's laughing and happy when they have a few beers. Or I don't know what they all do when they shoot up. You know, well, <laughs> I haven't been around that one. Uh, but, but the premise here on the behavioral learning model number six is that the alcohol intake is associated with positive rewarding experiences. So whether it's your family going on vacation and fishing and everybody kicking back and having a great time, or if it represents a big family reunion, or if it's what you and your best buddy do uh, and it's always a cool thing, or just whatever. Uh, in the most general sense, it may involve you get a positive reward out of using the chemicals. Okay, the sociocultural model. Okay, this one says that the environment is the chief contributing factor. Uh, because of your demographics or ethnographics, you know, I was born into this housing complex, I'm of this uh, ethnic type or economic group or just because of, of the social cultural environment that I find myself in that's what makes me who I am and in some instances there's evidence that that's a significant uh, contributing factor but as as we said before you know all of these have some degree of truth some degree of applicability uh, in some instances, but no one explains what happens to everybody, and they don't all seem to apply to any one person. So you just kind of have to uh, pick and choose and, and mix and match. Okay, the lifestyle model says the person likes the way they feel, the kind of life that they're living uh, because of the use of the drugs that the rewards of life and an altered state of consciousness outweigh all other costs of a destructive, drug-dependent lifestyle. So even though we talked about those physiological costs, you know, so it's rotting my liver, you know, I feel great. <laughs> or, uh, you know, so what if my brain waves are flat? Uh, it, you know, I, I believe that I'm in a state of euphoria. Uh, the drug makes me feel uh, really good. Uh, there are a couple of, of quotations uh, out of your text, page 333, uh, where they, the first is from a, a federal correctional incarcerate, an alcohol and cocaine addict, who put it this way, I can't imagine, uh, think of the best sex you ever had. Man, think how great that feeling was. I mean the best and the greatest. Well, that ain't nothing compared to shoving that spike in your arm and getting that first rush. That's why I do it. You know, well, that's, that's a lifestyle thing. It makes him feel so good that he's hooked on that feeling. And the fact that he could die from an overdose the next time, you know, it's worth the risk in that case. Uh, and I'll go ahead and quote this other one while we're here. They also quoted a university professor. They didn't say what university, uh, but I feel certain it was not U of H. Uh, 
because of where the book is written. Anyway, this is a recovering alcoholic who said, when you get stressed out, there are a number of things that you can do about it. You may go out, and, yeah, and you may leave your job. You may go out on your job. You can pray. You can meditate. You can have a fight with your wife, if you have one. Uh, you can chop wood, and so on. The problem with that payoff <clears throat> is that it's variable. It may or may not work. So when he gets stressed out, he drinks. And he says, my way works all the time and every time. It's invariable. I know what will happen before I do it. It's absolutely dependable in taking the pain away. Beat that. So uh, you know, both of those quotations uh, feed into this lifestyle model that, that uh, even if it's destroying the mind, even if it's psychologically wrecking the family, uh, it's worth it. Ginger? A long time ago, we lived in a poor section of town in Wichita, and we lived next door to a cocaine dealer um, who could be very nice, but generally was pretty much of a redneck jerk. And when he did cocaine, it just amplified his personality, so he became more of a jerk. But his, his uh, fiance shot up on heroin one night and OD'd. And so he, his, his reaction was just to do more cocaine, to numb the pain, rather than to stop because she had done that. He felt like he was, um, had principles and morals because he wouldn't deal to children or to people if it was taking food out of their children's mouths. I mean, he, was, he did have enough principles to do that. Um, so he was sort of a luxury dealer kind of, which was hard to be in the ghetto, but that's kind of what he was. Actually ghetto, but next to the ghetto. Okay. okay, thank you for sharing that. Okay, uh, we've already alert, alluded to the peer cluster model. Uh, this one links the drug use to small groups of people, and those people share similar beliefs, attitudes, values, and they share a rationale for drug use. They, they believe in this common lifestyle. Okay, and then the psychosocial model, the last one we have for consideration, says that there are numerous factors, including the individual's personality, the environment, and behavior, and that these are all interrelated into a dynamic state of, of problem behavior proneness. So, uh, you know, just reflect on these. Be aware that uh, any of these may be applicable if, as you find that uh, you're dealing with chemically dependent uh, people. You know, th there may be different reasons. We talked about attribution theory at the beginning of the semester, about lecture one or two, uh, how people systematically assign causes for human behavior. We try to figure out why people are doing what they're doing, and we'll discount one cause if there's another plausible cause. Well, this is, is part of what we're often doing when we're dealing with someone who's chemically dependent. Uh, those who are not look over and say, why would a person want to do this to their body? Why would they allow this to happen? How could they spend all their money in this way or, or run the health risks and so on? And, and the answers are not simple. And it may be any combination of these causes. But these are at least 10 approaches uh, for explaining why people are doing what they're doing. OK, uh, the text gives you some terms. I don't know if we need to go through those. Do you feel pretty comfortable with the words like abuse and addiction and alcoholism and so forth? Uh, we'll come to codependent in a little while. We're going to spend some time talking about uh, codependence and what their characteristics are. Uh, one of the things, though, is that uh, even with all those statistics that we cited a minute ago, there is still a, a belief that there is a serious underreporting of chemical dependency, that there's uh, just a, a lot of usage that goes on that 
doesn't get reported because it's not involved in any kind of accident. Uh, it just doesn't show up in a crime report anywhere, uh, anything like that. Okay, there's some defense mechanisms that are common to users. If you've got your book, you may want to uh, flip over to those and, and make some notes. Uh, page 333 is where they start. Okay, what about displacement? How might you see a, a user using displacement? Any ideas? Well, sometimes people displace their anger, they displace their hostilities, um, they find targets to unload their problems, and, and this is not directly connected to why they use the drugs. These are behaviors that you may find uh, alcohol, and I'm just going to use the term alcoholic here, but in some instances it's broader than that, so I don't have to keep qualifying uh, all of the sentences. Uh, but you may find the alcoholic uh, needing to ventilate hostilities, get anger out and so forth, and unloading their problems. And they may dump that on people or objects which simply do not deserve it. The old get angry and kick the dog or uh, you're mad at your boss so you smack somebody in the family or whatever. But displacement says that, that we don't direct our emotions and energies appropriately, they get misdirected uh, toward uh, other people or objects. Okay, fantasy. How might an alcoholic use fantasy? Uh, Melanie. Um, my neighbor is a recovering alcoholic and what he told me as an example of that, is that um, when he was drinking, he felt like, first of all, you can do anything. You can talk to anybody. You can um, pretty much be anyone that you want to be in that situation, or you think you can. In real life, he's terrified of getting in front of people, but when, he's, when he was drunk in a bar, he could do anything he wanted, and it was okay. It was okay with him. There seems to be some conflicting evidence there that some people do get their inhibitions wiped away and, and can get up and peel their clothes off and stand on the bar and sing or, or whatever. And then, but there's some evidence that says that uh, uh, becoming intoxicated doesn't do that to you, that, that you still won't do uh, things that you wouldn't want to do anyway. So whether it's in the same vein with hypnosis, uh, I'm not sure there. We, there's some conflicting evidence on that, but there, there are also studies that suggest this uh, reduction of inhibitions thing. Okay, but, but getting high, getting drunk, uh, may be a way to push reality aside, to be able to fantasize and dream big dreams and plan big plans and uh, talk pie in the sky uh, kinds of goals. Uh, it may help you escape boredom. Uh, it may help uh, the individual get over other frustrations and so forth just to escape into a world that's make-believe rather than real because they can, they can create a euphoria that's simply a more pleasant place to be. Okay, how about projection? Remember that psychological term? Back earlier, well, when Dr. Williamson was here, we talked about the importance of owning your own feelings and not projecting things onto other people. Does that sound familiar? Okay, of blaming other people. When, when we project, we, we put blame in other places. And projection may also 
uh, involve ascribing motives to other people that uh, are uh, often motives within the person themselves. If, if you are an extremely jealous person, then you may suspect your best friend of, of doing uh, sneaky, covert kinds of things. If you can't be trusted, then you may not be able to trust other people. If uh, uh, you are extremely greedy and self-serving, then you would project that emotion uh, or attitude or value to someone else. And so uh, alcoholics often contribute motives within themselves uh, to their significant others. Sensitivity, suspiciousness, hostility toward other people uh, may be manifestations of this. It may result in distancing, estrangement, a lack of communication. But yeah, this all gets projected and the reality of the emotions get distorted. Okay, how about rationalization? I ought to be able to punt with that one, Robert. Is that when they try to say that it's okay while I'm doing what I'm doing because I'm an adult, or I, I am, I've only, I'm only drinking so much, or I'm only getting drunk so many times a week. Mm -hmm. I'm not drunk every day, or whatever. Would that be rationalization? Yeah, that's part of it. And well, now part of that was minimization. Do we have that one? Yeah, that's coming up in a couple. When, you know, it was only, I mean, I was only drunk for 12 hours. You know, I only passed out for four. A big deal. You know, so, so that part of it's minimization. Of it. It's just not that big a deal. Uh, rationalization, uh, someone wants to find as engineering reasons for, conclu for preconceived conclusions. Engineering reasons for preconceived conclusions. I wanted to do it, but I need to find a good reason so... Uh, my children just drove me to it, you know, and, and that makes it okay. Or, you know, if you had to work with that boss, I mean, you would need to go to happy hour too. You know, well, that's my excuse. Edna, did you have your hand up? It makes me go to sleep, helps me sleep better. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. You know, I'm just so wired at the end of the day that, uh, you know, I, I need five p.m. pills to help me unwind or, you know, six glasses of wine or I don't know what the number is out there. Yeah, but all of those are, are excuses for doing what we wanted to do anyway. Instead of just saying, I really like the way it tastes and I like the way it makes me feel and I'm choosing to wreck my liver. Yeah. And once in a while you find somebody who'll say that. But anyway, if, if they're rationalizing, then they're making up excuses to justify their behavior. Okay, any idea about what's going on with intellectualization? That it makes me smarter to drink. <laughs> no, but that's a good guess. Or do drug. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of linked into uh, the minimizing thing. But it, it's getting real theoretical. Of, you want to take a crack at it? Um, I remember in high school, a lot of the guys in high school used to always say, I drive better after I drink. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me more alert. Yeah. My acuity is up. Uh, I don't know. What do they tell you? <laughs> You're not holding your microphone down, Ginger. Did the girls believe them? Oh. <laughs> Wouldn't that be also kind of like how they, say, well, in the Bible, you know, they talk about some drinks being good, you know, caring for the soul. And some people think that a drink a day is good, you know, it helps with your ailments and stuff. So well, and it fun. might be. You know, I mean, there are doctors out there that are prescribing certain levels of alcoholic intake for some people. And it's not my business to argue with that. But we're just describing things happening here. Laura? Lay off on you. I think it makes them a better conversationalist, more open-minded, and can talk easier, more, I guess, intellectual in that way. Okay. Uh, part of, of what is going on is that the person may tell you that they've done extensive reading on the subject and that the, the alcoholic content of this product is so low compared to the, the content of that product, and I get this with uh, cigarette smokers. 
you know, well, I'm, and I don't know one brand from the other, but, you know, I'm using this brand, and the nicotine level is so low here compared to that that it's just really inconsequential. And so we get into this discussion of how thick the filters are or how fine the paper is or uh, whatever it is, and, and it becomes an intellectual discussion of how the product is made or whether hops are good for your system for some reason, and it bypasses the real issue turns into a kind of encyclopedia type discussion. Okay, minimizing we talked about uh, simply playing down the seriousness of the situation for whatever reason you can come up with. Okay, what's a reaction formation? You bumped into that in psychology? We can tell who hasn't read the chapter out there tonight. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Uh, if this occurs as a defense against a perceived threat, it can be very harmful. It distances dependents from their true feelings. Uh, let's see, maybe, let me give you Gordon's little example here. Those kids of mine, those little ingrates, I gave them everything. Lisa just stares at me. Mark said I didn't love him because I missed a lousy soccer game. He sure didn't miss his personal computer I got him. No time for the old man because he was too busy himself. That kid never loved me. Always took up for his mom. He's just, he's done a reaction formation, totally gone overboard backwards. You know, reacted the opposite of how he should have. Okay, so you're with a reaction formation, you're getting a negative reverse reaction taking place. Okay, regression. Okay, you're getting uh, a behavior that's emotional, uh, immature, kind of self-serving. The person may regress in their behavior to temper tantrums, childlike behavior. Melanie. Well, when people drink a lot, I, I see mo a lot more d domestic violence, um, and that has to do with the regression of um, when, you, when you're sober, you tend to think more rationally, more maturely. When you when you have that alteration, um, you tend to you did this, and you know, like okay, now that's projection. projection. That's blaming. Right. You know, you made me do this. It's your fault that this happened. But I think that relates to the regression because I don't think right. rationally a lot of people. Right, they, people, they regress and then they project. Right. Yeah, good. Okay, we got that one sorted out. Yeah, but, but a lot of childlike behavior, you think of regressing in emotional behavior, pouting, sulking, uh, temper tantrums, throwing dishes, stomping feet, slamming doors, banging things around uh, is a kind of regressive behavior. Okay, what about repression? Forget about your problems. Okay, you just, you bury stuff. Just take it and, and stuck it, stuck it away, that's good. Uh, <laughs> stick it away, bury it so that the hurtful, painful memories are stuck way back. And it doesn't, some of these things are not just characteristic of alcoholics. You know, they're, they're things that we all do, and uh, painful memories are often repressed. But it's true that alcoholics also, oh, pardon me, yeah, let me, that alcoholics will do that in order to uh, forget hurtful things that they've done. And another thing, another type of repression in that same sense would be trying to hide the problem from yourself. You know, like getting rid of all of, all of your cans or evidence and stuff so that one, your family doesn't see how much you're drinking and you don't see how much you're drinking so that you don't think you're really having a problem. Okay. Uh, actually, that leads into some things that enablers and codependents do, one of which is suppression of the problem. So we're going to come to that in just a minute, but we probably ought to talk about what codependents are uh, first. But it's typical of, of the family's behavior to suppress and hide and keep the family secret and so forth. Okay. Sometimes alcoholics do it too, hide it. Right. And I, the family. That's true too. Good point. Okay. 
Want to take a crack at defining codependency? Robert? The relationship between the alcoholic or the drug user and the people that are their friends or close relatives around them and how the, the alcoholic um, behaves toward these people and then how these people in, a, in essence behave towards the alcoholic it creates this kind of a uh, kind of a weird type of relationship where they both are they both in a way rely. yeah depend on or rely upon this weird sick kind of relationship okay and what are they doing in this relationship we've got enabling and codependency kind of linked together here Larry you want to help him out everything you've said is right so. a codependent facilitates the abuse and it um, whether they accept it openly or pretend like it's not there by facilitating it not dealing with it therefore creating a cycle of it just never ending and continually happening I think Melanie the behavior of a codependent, if the alcoholic or drug, well, drug abuser wasn't in the state of abusing drugs, the other family or friend um, member wouldn't know how to act. It's, it's a learned behavior, and you rely on them to be drunk or on drugs. Therefore, you learn how to react to them, and then when they're not, you're not sure how to rely on, you rely on that, their behavior, and you react. Yeah, you're on the right track. You kind of you kind of build like a, a second foundation where if this is how you're used to this person acting, you're going to become their strength when they're not, so that you feel better about yourself. But at the same time, it's hurting them, and so it keeps coming back. They get worse, and you start trying to make them better, and it just keeps going over and over again. And then once you try to get away from it, you don't know how to be yourself, how not to depend yeah. on anyone else. Yeah, and and when you put all of this together that you've just said. You know, you get a very enmeshed relationship. Remember lecture one, systems theory? Okay, and how the parts of the system, the family system, are interdependent on one another. And, and you get a very tight enmeshed. It's a, it's a healthy thing to be interdependent. I mean, you get a goal-seeking group, whether it's a class or a family or a corporation. You, know, you, you speech majors hear systems theory come up all over the place. And the interdependence that goes from parts working together in order to achieve a goal, that's a good thing. But all this stuff that you've just said about the entanglement, the loss of identity of who you are, and, and we're going to come to several things here, uh, when your life is totally directed by your response to what someone else is doing, You've crossed over a line again on that continuum. Uh, the book also uses the term enabler. There are some people who enable others to keep on abusing. You know, uh, maybe you go out with the person every weekend so that when they get drunk, you can drive home. Well, gee, if you didn't go out with them in the first place and if they're underage, and they had to stay home to start with, maybe they wouldn't get drunk. But you might rationalize, well, no, they'd get it somewhere anyway, which might be true. Uh, so I'm going to go on out with them, and at least I'll know that they're safe. And so what you end up doing is facilitating or helping that situation along. Okay, uh, some stuff on codependency, and uh, this is, is out of that... Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University material that we started earlier, uh, revised by CompCare uh, local group. Okay, what is codependency? Well, first of all, my good feelings, and, and all of you have been through the self-esteem stuff and, and trying to know who you are and, the, and recognize the importance of a, a healthy self-concept, good self-esteem. Well, if you're codependent, you don't have that on your own. Instead, your good feelings stem, well, I need to stay within this frame of reference. My good feelings about who I am stem from being liked by you and receiving approval from you. And then you can plug in whoever, uh, the significant other, 
in your life is, but your the liking and the approval comes from someone else rather than from within yourself. Okay, your struggle, if I'm the codependent, your struggles affect my serenity, my peace of mind. My mental attention focuses on solving your problems and relieving your pain. Now that's, you know, friends do that up to a point. Your friends help you out. If, if you're hurting, they try to fix it uh, so that you're not hurting. If you've got a problem, you very often share that uh, with your closest friends so that they can help you find an answer to that. But if, if you are driven by solving another person's problems, then it's getting out of balance. Melanie? Does that lead into the area of uh, a lot of abusers act that way and they um, focus so much on trying to solve everyone else's problems because they don't want to think about their own and it covers it up a little bit. They worry enough about everybody else. Or I'm not the abuser but the, the, me the family member or the friend. Worry enough about everyone else's problems that they don't have to worry about their own. Yeah, that may be what's going the on. Codependency. Mm -hmm. But as a codependent behavior, if I'm spending all my time trying to fix Rose's life, I mean, she calls me and tells me she had a fight with her secretary this morning, and I just get all engrossed in that and digging for details and trying to work out how to fix it, and it's really her business. I mean, if she asked me for help, that's one thing. You know, how many choices do I have? Can you, you know, and often we do that with friends. We have, Robert, you know, I'm stuck here. I, you know, I've, got a, I've got a problem. Can you help me see any other alternatives in this situation? Well, that's good crisis management. But if Robert's having the problem and I keep sticking my nose in trying to fix it for him so it will make me feel good, and I can say, oh, yeah, you know, I fixed it for Robert. You know, I did great. You know, where is my life? Where is who I'm supposed to be if, if I'm spending, and particularly when, when you latch on uh, to one or two people like that and, and your whole purpose in life is fixing everything for the, and particularly if you've got somebody over here that's making messes real regularly, getting arrested by the police, getting drunk, showing up at work late, uh, you know, being socially irresponsible, and, and you're just working like a beaver trying to fix everything for that person so that uh, they'll still look good. You know, you've, you've lost your perspective. Okay, uh, it may involve my mental attention is focused on pleasing you, protecting you, and manipulating you to do it my way. You know, most codependents have a real vested interest in that other person and in getting them to be or do what, what you want them to do, whether it's manipulating them into coming to a party with you on the weekend or uh, just whatever behavior you're trying to accomplish. And you can spend a lot of, of mental attention doing that. Okay, and it gets back to self-esteem again. My self-esteem is not bolstered by what I've done for me, but it's bolstered by solving your problems and relieving your pain. Can, can you see the difference in this? Can't tell out there, okay. Uh, if you really get absorbed in it, my own hobbies, my own interests get put aside. My time is spent sharing your interests and your hobbies. If, if you found yourself just melding into someone else's life and losing your own personal identity, that might be a clue that something's going on. Uh, your clothing and personal appearance is dictated by my desires as I feel you're a reflection of me. If you're writing the other person about how they should look, how they should dress, how they should present themselves in public, uh, you're stopping them and dressing them before they go out the door each morning um, because you don't want to be embarrassed by how they show up at work. Okay. Um, your behavior is dictated by my desire because I feel you're a reflection on me. You know, so I, I try to get you to behave in a restaurant uh, to function in a certain way. 
Okay. I'm not aware of how I feel. I am aware of how you feel. I'm not aware of what I want, and I ask you what you want. And if I'm not aware, I assume. But sometimes the codependent uh, doesn't, it, it, I don't know how to work crazy. They're out of touch with their own emotions. They're so busy making sure, you know, is, is Lara angry? You know, what, what happens? She doesn't look the same tonight that, that she usually does. You know, what's going on? So I'm, I'm trying to check her out and, and see what's going on here. Or, or if Darren's really happy, I want to find out why. I mean, man, you know, like, what, what happened? And, and so I'm living my life through whoever it is that I'm codependent on without stopping to say, how do I feel about this? Am I happy? Am I angry? Am I upset? And if so, why? Why not? You know, but it's all getting channeled through that other person. Okay, the dreams I have, now this one I have a little trouble with, but I think it, it's talking about to the extreme. The dreams I have for my future are linked to you. Now certainly you know, I would hope that spouses or, or very best friends or whatever may uh, have some linkage in their planning there. I'd hate to think, you know, you're married and, and you and your wife have, have or husband, whichever, I happen to look at Darren, so I was thinking of this, but, you know, that you've got totally, yeah, he's got his ring on, you know. Uh, uh, and those of you listening in, this is the same Darren that used to be out west each week and he just couldn't resist us. So he, you know, if you can't lick him, join him. And so here he is. And so it's nice to have Darren here. Uh, but but if, you're, if your dreams are so tied to the other person that if that person fails in their pursuit of a dream, you're devastated, you know, then there's something wrong. If, if this is a couple working on a dream, then you ought to both be working on that dream. It ought to be a shared responsibility, a shared goal setting. Not, here's a person with a dream and, and the other person is just feeding into that and, and tagging on behind, you know, hitching their wagon to somebody else's star. I use a worn out metaphor. Okay, uh, I use giving as a way of feeling safe in the relationship. Uh, by giving your time, giving your energy, giving your money, uh, whatever it is, you get so attached to that other person, uh, but that makes you feel safe and secure. If they're willing to use you lots of time, lots of energy, and so forth, uh, it helps. And again, the line gets funny because friends spend time together. Friends do things together. But it's a reciprocal kind of deal. You know, and if it's one person doing all the giving in order to try to keep the other person happy or okay, uh, then it's become a lopsided, codependent kind of relationship. Okay, and this says, I put my values aside in order to connect with you. You know, if you're, I can't imagine any of you doing that. <laughs> but, you know, but, but if you are so attracted to this person on one level, that you set aside moral standards or, or values and beliefs that used to be important to you uh, in order to stay linked to that person, then that's another sign of codependency. It says, I value your opinion, your way of doing things more than my own. Again, that ties back to the notion of self-esteem, of self-confidence, of knowing who you are, respecting who you are. And there are times when it's appropriate to value someone's opinion more than your own. When you check credentials and you, and you recognize that this is either a person of uh, considerable credibility because of their expertise or a person of considerable ethos uh, because of, of their character and integrity, there are times that it's appropriate to say, okay, you know, I respect this person so much that I'm going to change what I believe because of what they believe. And that ties us into persuasion theory and uh, ethics and credibility and so forth. And we won't bog down in that. Except a footnote that there are times when that's an appropriate response. And we do have cognitive and behavioral changes because we encounter sources of information uh, 
testimony from highly credible people. But that's a different thing than simply saying, I am I'm so dependent on this person to even have an existence, you know, so, so that I can even believe that I exist as a person, that I'm throwing aside uh, perhaps values that you were taught uh, throughout your life and, and you set those things aside in order to take care of this other person because you're so dependent on that person. And then the last one says, the quality of my life is in relation to the quality of yours. You know, if you're having a great day, then I'm having a great day. And if you are in the dumps, then I'm in the dumps. And, and that the whole quality of my life is linked into yours. So a person who is codependent <clears throat> is likely to have difficulty identifying their own feelings. Uh, they may have trouble expressing their feelings. They'll probably have trouble forming and maintaining close relationships. They may feel like they're close to this other person, uh, but it's because uh, they have a kind of a d an addictive attachment to that other person but it's not a reciprocal uh, healthy. Is your hand up? Yeah, just real quick, just a quick comment or whatever. Mm -hmm. if, they, if a child especially starts off in that codependent relationship at home with their parents, whether it be because of substance abuse or whatever, their relationships that they form in adulthood later on are codependent relationships also. Because once they leave that home nest, and this is some of what my favorite was on, but once they leave that home nest, they don't have anyone to be dependent on, anyone who needs them anymore so they tend to fall towards somebody who, who needs them the same way that that parent needed them when they were younger. Right, because the approval is coming from other people rather than from within yourself. So there may be trouble making decisions, uh, but these people are often people pleasers. They may tell lies. They may uh, blame, project, be judgmental, uh, a number of things like that that are at cross purposes with developing a healthy respect for their own self-esteem. Okay, we're going to take a break, and then when we resume class, we will let you meet our guest speaker, okay? <laughs>